Welcome to the Carlo College St. Patrick's virtual information session for the MA and postgraduate diploma in Irish regional history. I am the quality assurance officer and a lecturer in history here at Carlo College. Tonight, I will serve as a host for this virtual information session. Before my esteemed colleagues introduce themselves and we start our discussion, I want to provide you with a brief overview of our proceedings here tonight. Over the next 45 to 50 minutes, we will provide you with an in-depth overview of these exciting new programs covering topics such as program content, teaching and learning, assessment, and how to apply uh, to these programs. Our hope is that most, if not all, of your questions will be answered here tonight. At the end of our discussion, there will be time for attendees to ask questions via the Q&A feature. Um, as such, if you have questions throughout the evening, please ask them via that feature, and I hope to get to many of them before the end of our sessions tonight. Without further delay, I am going to invite my fellow colleagues to introduce themselves. Dr. Murphy, I will start with you. Thanks, Eric. So hello, everybody. My name is uh, Margaret Murphy. I live in County Carlo. I've been teaching in Carlo College for nearly 12 years. I'm a historian of the medieval period in, in Ireland and in Europe. I'm particularly interested in economic and social history and the history of settlement and agriculture. Uh, I've frequently worked with uh, historical geographers and archaeologists, so they're the sort of perspectives I'll be, be bringing into this program. Aida is next. My name is Aida Milton. I'm a social historian. I was born in County Wexford, but I live in County Kildare now. Um, I work principally on the social history of infectious disease, things like pandemics, so those little known and much misunderstood things. And I look at them through um, historical demography and an oral history perspective to try and tell stories of the people and of sufferers of those diseases. I also look at uh, another area of research that I'm really keenly interested in is the social history um, of religion in Ireland and particularly of Irish Protestantism in the Southeast. Uh, in Carlo College, I teach mostly European history. Elaine. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Um, I'm Elaine Callanan, and I'm a lecturer in modern Irish history in Carlo College, St. Patrick's. And my main um, research areas um, of history are the 19th and 20th centuries. And I also enjoy the 17th and 18th centuries in Irish history, in modern Irish history particularly. I'm particularly interested in politics of the 20th century, um, both on a, on a regional and national scale, and um, you know, how it affected the lives of ordinary people in Ireland um, is, is a particular interest of mine. I've also interests in war and rebellion in all of these eras as well, and that's what I'll be bringing to the story um, of the MA programme. Regina. Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Regina. I'm also uh, a lecturer in modern Irish history in Carlow College. At the moment, I'm teaching um, half a millennium's worth of history of Irish history from 1500 to 2000. So just a something to whet your appetite, I guess. <laughs> um, my main research interests are um, migration primarily. So I'm a migration historian. I'm very interested in the Irish diaspora particularly, but also um, I like to focus my work on methodologies like transnationalism and comparative history. So these are things that very much interest me uh, and my work. Um, Irish social history is also um, something that uh, I work quite regularly in, uh, particularly the uh, history of women during the revolutionary period is something that I've been looking at and also return migration to Ireland during the revolutionary period as well. Um, so that's that's what I contribute to the course. Thank you. And thank you for those brief introductions. Um, probably to get this discussion started, I'm going to direct the first kind of question to Margaret. Um, and really, it's just to get a flavor for uh, how this program came about um, and why maybe regional 
uh, Irish regional history versus local history or national history. Um, so maybe just tell a little bit about uh, the background of the program, maybe some aims, objectives of the program. Okay, thanks, Eric. Um, so history as a discipline has been developing significantly in Carlow College over the last couple of decades. Um, at the moment, we have six historians on the staff, all of them qualified to PhD level, um, and a lot of historical research going on. So the development of a master's programme was really something that, you know, we, we have been talking about for a while. Um, it seemed like an, a natural progression for us um, to develop this programme. And um, I suppose another thing that led into the development of this programme was, um, you know, a relationship that's building up between Carlo College and uh, Carlo Institute of Technology. And this program, although it will be delivered in Carlo College and delivered by Carlo College staff, is actually validated by um, Carlo IT. So students on this program will essentially be students of both of those uh, institutions. In terms of why regional history, Irish regional history, we wanted to create a program that was reflective of the college and its historians and its uh, location. Um, a program that would appeal to a number of different interest groups and that would also fill a gap in terms of um, the, the provision of, of history MAs in the Southeast. So regional history for us ticked all of those boxes. Um, it's positioned sort of midway between national history and local history. So, you know, essentially one way of defining it is, is in terms of its scale. Um, so national history obviously takes the, the state as its, uh, as its area of study, while local history would focus on the locality, sometimes quite a small locality. Regional history, um, because of you know being placed in the middle, it gives you the opportunity to focus in on an area, but it's an area that gives you a sort of a broader canvas mm. to work on than say local history, which which can be a little bit uh, confining. And I suppose there is quite an overlap between local and regional history. One of the things that regional history does is it allows you the opportunity to look at a number of different localities and do a sort of a comparative um, analysis, you know, at, at the regional level. Another thing that regional history does is it gives you scope to look at groups that are maybe sometimes left out of both the national story on one side and, and the very local story on the other side. So, so groups like women, um, like uh, the, the working classes, like migrants, for example, regional history gives you an excellent sort of canvas to look at those particular groups. So the more we looked at regional history, the more we realized that, you know, we are regional historians. We do a lot of regional history. We're interested in those sorts of things. And we thought that other people would be as well. Thank you. And it, and it sounds like from what you're describing on the program that it is quite unique in Ireland. And um, would that be safe to say that it's a unique program in that regard that it is doing regional history um, in the Republic of Ireland? Yeah, we certainly found no other program that is looking specifically at, at regional history in, in the Republic. So it is unique in that sense. Um, it's also, I would say, unique in terms of the range of different modules that we're offering. So. We're offering modules on oral history and cultural heritage, which you'll probably hear a little bit more about um, later on. Um, it's an evening delivery as well, which I think um, you know should appeal to people who maybe have work or family um, responsibilities during the nine to five. Um, and, you know, I think we need to say it's very competitively priced um, if you compare it to other masters that, that, that are out there. So, um, yeah, for a number of different yeah. reasons, we've got uh, quite unique. And you touched on there, and I maybe 
bring in other your colleagues in uh, Ida in particular. Uh, you know, this program is a part time program. Um, how many hours of classes will there be? Uh, what's the difference between the MA uh, program and the postgraduate diploma? Can you just elaborate on that a little bit more? Yes, so there will be about 72 hours in semester one and another 72 hours in semester two. And then in semester three, people moved more towards their own study. So there'll be, I think it's 36 hours then in semester three. And in the final semester, semester four, uh, those who go on to do the dissertation and the full MA uh, will, will do their dissertation or complete their dissertation in, 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 in uh, semester four. So the difference between the two is the level of award, obviously a diploma for one and a master's for the other and the people who are doing um, uh, the master's will do a long written dissertation whereas the diploma uh, they will do some other sort of concluding project uh, which will be shorter and you know will require less research it, it could take a number of forms yeah very good um, and what about career opportunities um, you know, potential career opportunities, everybody who's uh, uh, applying for programs, uh, you know, they're either in career. Um, Elaine, maybe would you uh, elaborate more on the type of career opportunities would be available? Sure. Well, I'd like to think even that a lot of people might join in and do this MA and um, postgraduate diploma simply because they love history. But aside from that, um, you know, the, 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 the programs are designed to encourage lifelong learning. And um, so the MA degree is a very useful, uh, very useful for progression if learners are thinking about undertaking a PhD or a career in academia. But if that's not for you, uh, both of the degrees really aim to provide graduates with the ability to pursue a range of professional pathways. And I'll just give a few examples um, here. Like for example, you could think about the heritage agencies uh, and centers, County Council Heritage Officers, Conservation and Restoration, Museums, National Parks, Tourism, Charities and NGOs, Civil Service, Arts Administration, and I could make that list longer, but we could be here for quite a while. So what I suppose what I'm trying to get across is that, you know, the, the skill sets even that you will learn um, on these programmes, uh, whether it's the, the postgraduate diploma or the MA, will really, you know, give you a, such a broad wealth of ability in terms of analytical skills, writing skills, presentation skills, all of those kind of things that you're opening up many doors in terms of career. Thank you. And again, I, I see some questions coming in. That's great. Uh, in the q and I'll take those kind of at the end. We'll kind of go through those um, at, at the end. Um, when we get there. So I'll kind of maybe move on the discussion and bring Regina into the discussion uh, a little bit and maybe just take me through the key areas that will be explored in the program. You know, for instance, can you give us some information um, about the modules that will form part of these programs um, and some of the other activities uh, that will be discussed throughout uh, the course? Absolutely, Eric. So um, <clears throat> in semester one, students will um, be honing in on their historiographical skills, but they'll also get a chance to uh, explore themes in history. So the idea with semesters one and semesters two is that on the one hand, we are developing the transferable skills that Elaine spoke about. That means that you can go out into the workplace and work in a variety of careers. Uh, but we also want to obviously get down to the, you know, the, the task of doing history. And that is a really strong theme right across the program. The idea um, that uh, students on the program will get the opportunity to actually do history. So in semester one, students uh, will study two uh, modules. The first one is exploring historiography and research methods. Um, so this will give students a very strong grounding, I guess, in um, how historians do their work. So how historians write history and the motivations and inevitably the biases that historians have as they write history. Uh, so we've coupled that with, re with research methods, so we'll be exploring things like qualitative and quantitative analysis, we'll look at public history, we'll be looking at mapping history, so really giving students uh, a wealth of knowledge about the different ways that historians can actually go about doing the job of writing history. Now to complement that, because at times it can be quite... Um, intense in terms of theory, uh, but we've also then designed another module for semester one that looks at themes in history. So that module is called um, 
discourse and dissonance. Um, <clears throat> and that is a team taught module. So students will get to meet each of the four lecturers as they will indeed in exploring history and research methods. Um, but the themes that we'll be looking at in discourse and dissonance are settlement, landscape and environment. We'll also be thinking about war and rebellion, um, disease and health and demography and migration. So um, we'll be thinking about these obviously in a regional context, uh, but we have the scope there to map up, I guess, to a more national perspective and to uh, zone in a little bit more closely to micro level as well. So again, that is the beauty of a course in regional history, we're, we're situated in the center, so we can look at the macro picture or the micro picture and contextualize accordingly. In semester two, then students will also have one kind of theory based module um, and they will study three other modules in semester two. So the first one, I guess, is historical research design and practice. Now, this really is a module that's designed to give the student the tools they need to write their dissertation and even beyond that to write history to a professional standard. So um, we are obviously focused on the end product here, which is ultimately a thesis. But again, looking at the transferable skills, we want students to be able to go out uh, and to contribute um, and, and write history to a professional standard. So we'll be looking at um, ways that historians write history uh, in that particular module, giving students the tools they need to actually get, uh, get their research done. Um, but to complement that, then we have a lovely module called Stories from the Archive. Uh, so we will be looking for um, student input in this. So the themes that we're kind of suggesting uh, at the moment are some, th some things like uh, sport history, for example, the history of crime, um, community health. These are just some examples, but given the uh, student cohort that we have on the program, we're totally open to looking at, uh, well, I don't know, the history of food, for example. I'm sure we could... Uh, <laughs> we could all challenge ourselves and think about that. So Stories from the Archive is really quite open um, and it's a chance for students to actually experience what it is like to use an archive. Um, and then the other two modules uh, on in semester two of year one is cultural heritage, where we think about um, the importance of heritage around us. So tangible and intangible heritage, the importance of monuments, the importance of commemoration and remembering how people remember in a certain way. Um, all of these things are, are built into our, our understanding of cultural heritage. And this is something that that module explores in, in great detail. Um, and the final module then in semester two of year one is Revealing Hidden Voices. This is one of the modules that makes our program very, very unique. Uh, it's a, a module based entirely around oral history. So students will get absolutely essential skills in being able to um, conduct oral history interviews, the importance of building an oral history archive. Um, also thinking about things like the ethics involved uh, in, in trying to record oral history. And I'm sure Ida can speak a little bit more to that as, as we go on. In year three then, um, we have a module called Debating History. Oh, sorry, this is, um, we renamed it. <laughs> it's actually called Emerging Histories now. So this is the research seminar. Um, and this is an opportunity for students to actually present some of their own research. So um, as part of the history, history research and design um, module, students will be asked to put together a thesis proposal. And so then in semester three, they will actually start to present some of the research that they're finding. Um, and that will be a communal space where students can present their research uh, in a peer setting uh, and get feedback and questions and suggestions and, and all that sort of thing from both staff and other students on the program. Um, and then if you are in um, the postgraduate diploma course, you will probably uh, finish off your capstone project there. Um, and if you are going on to the MA program, you will have semester four to do your thesis. So at the end of semester four, we very much looking, we're, we're very much looking forward to you qualifying with your MA at the end of it all. And just to say we have uh, quite, we will be discussing the thesis dissertation um, a little bit later, but there is a relevant question that I'm going to just bring back to you, Regina. Um, and it is, you know, there are learners that might register uh, for this program. Um, how important is it to have a research topic in mind? Or is this something that will be developed 
uh, that could be developed over the course of the program. Well, what I would say to that, Eric, is if you have a research topic in mind, that's fantastic. If you don't have a research topic until halfway through semester two, that is also absolutely fine. In some ways, if you if you don't have a topic, it gives you more scope to enjoy the broad range of material on the program. So you, you might have uh, an idea that you like sport history, for example. And then when we start to look at it, you're thinking, oh, well, maybe I like I don't know, health history or environmental history a bit more. So uh, not having a topic in mind really is not a problem. I probably might even suggest it's an advantage if you don't have a topic in mind. Um, having said that, if you have a true passion for something like in my own situation, for example, I was passionate about migration from the word go um, and that passion only grew the more I learned about it. So, you know, there really is no right answer to that question. If you have a topic in mind, make sure you're passionate about it and that you want to actually get down and research more into it. Uh, but equally, if you don't have a topic in mind, this course offers you a blank canvas that you can experience a whole range of topics um, and then find something that suits your own interest. Yeah, thank you. And I, uh, you had mentioned uh, oral history and maybe Ida, the expert here on oral history, um, and we'll be teaching the oral history module. Uh, you know, can you just expand further on, uh, you know, a little bit about the oral history module um, and will students be conducting uh, oral history interviews? Yeah, well, um, oral history is practiced like at, at a really sophisticated level in, in North America, but in the island of Ireland, for some reason, it, it hasn't really um, caught on at academic level, even though it's very much practiced in the community. And one of the things I like about this, uh, you know, that we can teach this at MA level is that we can both um, help to train up people who want to operate at it in the community and also people who want to practice it at academic level. So um, oral history is very delightful to use but very tricky to use and but there are certain principles and once you apply those and use those your project will will you know work much better um in terms of what we're going to actually do in the course you'll obviously be introduced to the best practice the leading oral historians around the world hopefully we'll even get some of them to join in on um live connection as some of my first year students have already managed to do and um we will, um, you will be interviewing, uh, you'll be interviewing around a theme in groups. And then what we'll do with those interviews is we'll collect them together and make podcasts with them. And of course, during the pandemic, a lot of people have been rushing towards podcasting. But if you podcast with interviews, you turn uh, your podcast into something really, really rich. Thank you. Um, and that will be a great opportunity, again, uh, to build on new skills um, uh, for everyone um, involved. And maybe uh, just to kind of come back again to program content, you know, maybe the out of classroom experience. And I'm going to direct this to Elaine um, by what type of practical, you know, this is, there is going to be a practical nature to this program, um, you know, of doing history. What, are, what, are, what opportunities will be available uh, to the learners on this program? Thanks, Eric. Yeah, well, I suppose what we really want to set out to do is, you know, we see the MA and the, and the postgraduate diploma as, as a collaborative situation between lecturer and student. So really from the get go, um, like, you know, there'll be seminar style lectures as opposed to a lecturer standing up and preaching at you all of the time. It's going to be involvement from the get go. But along with that and along with the oral history that um, Ida has just spoken about, uh, there'll also be a field trip um, where you'll actually go out and do, and that'll be held on a Saturday. There'll be opportunities for independent primary research in archives, uh, and you'll be guided through some of that and some of the modules. And really what we're hoping students will do is start to explore some of the archives that have remained relatively untouched, but are actually within the Carlo region, um, and some of them even within Carlo College itself. So, um, you know, there's great opportunity in this to, to broaden historical knowledge, really, by the doing of history. And then we also hope that students will present some of their work, that they'll showcase what they're up to. And in that, we're hoping to have some in-college events in order to enable this, um, you know, and it'll be constructed. You won't be getting additional work for this. It'll be constructed around the assignments that you're already, uh, will have already undertaken. 
And then we hope to have a couple of visiting lectures. Um, I just spoke briefly there about it as well on certain topics so that uh, you, you get a broader um, knowledge base uh, towards your degree. But all the way through all of this, whether it's in class or whether it is out of class experience, and even if it is technology, and some people might find that a bit daunting, you know, there will be instruction and there will be guidance all the way through. It's, it's, a, it's a case really, I think, of a working together and a doing together in terms of regional history. Thank you. And I think one of the things, uh, some of the questions that are coming through, I think we're gonna be touching on uh, now coming up. Um, but again, Margaret, to maybe bring you into this discussion, can you just talk a little bit more about the teaching and assessment methods that will be used on this program? I know some of the questions that have come in about course delivery and is it accessed online? All of these different, uh, maybe kind of integrate that into uh, your, uh, our discussion. Okay, so I suppose the first thing to say is that the program is designed for face-to-face -face delivery. Um, so um, it is our fervent hope <laughs> um, that we will be delivering the program face-to-face -face, um, come September. If, um, you know, if, if for some reason that is not possible, and I think if we've learned anything over the last um, year or so, it's that... Um, plans are um, very subject to change. Um, if that's not possible, we know that we can very quickly pivot to delivering online. We've all built up quite a lot of experience over the last year um, at online delivery. So um, if, if that's what, what is required, um, the, we will start off the program delivering online. But as I said, the program is designed for face-to-face uh, delivery so as quickly as possible we would resume that um, so it, it's not a blended program in that if if the program is operating face to face in the college that would be the sole delivery method um, for the program if as I said something happens and we have to deliver online then that would be the sole um, delivery method and um, so and you know, we, if there's more specific questions about that, we can address them them later on. Uh, in terms of the teaching, uh, the ten credit modules, and when you start in semester one, it's two ten credit modules. One is delivered um, on a Tuesday evening, one on a Thursday evening. The the lecture, the class is three hours um, for those ten credit. In semester two, when you're doing four or five credits, then, then the class time is, is one and a half hours. So some of that time would be the traditional, what we call chalk and talk um, delivery, um, although we'd be talking about PowerPoint slides rather than uh, than using chalk. I don't know, maybe some of the, the others do still use chalk <laughs> in their classes, but um, so that I, I suppose that is a more traditional lecture delivery of content, but more time I think is going to be devoted to the sort of active um, learning and, and um, communal learning that Elaine has already uh, alluded to. Um, so there would be a lot of class time um, given over to debate, to discussion, to working um, on primary sources, to the sort of practicing um, of skills. Uh, what we have in mind is, is a sort of a learning community where we're, you know, we're all learning from each other, we're sharing uh, knowledge and, and we're creating new knowledge uh, as well. To achieve that, obviously, um, students have to be prepared to put in preparation work before the class. Uh, so you sort of come to the class already with some ideas, with some preparation uh, done. Um, so students are, are active rather than passive in the classes is, is how I would describe it. Uh, you will have some classes with all four of us. Um, other classes with, with, with two of us and then and then classes with, with, with one teacher as well. So, so we'll mix that up um, quite a bit. Um, in terms of assessment, we have quite a wide range of assessments on the, uh, the, the programs. Um, they're linked to the learning outcomes and um, they're, they're 
put together in a way that allows students to progressively build skills, develop and practice uh, skills so that um, they are then in a good position both to complete their capstone um, projects, uh, but also to deliver those skills that they, they may need in, in the workplace. So there will be some essays, some project work, but also things like oral presentations, um, blogs, podcasts, they've been mentioned already, posters, um, some assessments will be group assessments. So you will work um, with, um, with a small group of other students um, and that promotes sort of collaborative skills. Um, not all assessments will actually be marked. Some of them would be what we call formative assessments and they're really designed so that we can give feedback to students um, that they then can use to put in a, an assignment that is, that is marked. Um, but in terms of you know, your overall award mark, all of the assessments that, that you do will be building up towards that, will be contributing uh, to that end of award. Um, thank you. That's very comprehensive. Um, and a lot of assessments. Uh, I'm kind of struck here by thinking what resources will be available, um, in particular, thinking of the library resources, uh, what archival access may they have, uh, students have. So, Regina, would you care to elaborate on that? Sure. Well, students on the program are actually in a very fortuitous situation because they uh, not only have access to the archives and uh, library at Carlow College, they also will have access to the library and archives at Carlow IT. So maybe if we start with Carlow College, so um, the PJ Brophy Library is um, the college, the main college library itself. There's an extensive history collection there, um, which students will have access to. Uh, and also the uh, broad range of electronic resources that the uh, library in Carlow College has subscriptions to, for example, EBSCO and JSTOR. So these will all be available to students uh, to use uh, remotely if they're studying from home, for example. Uh, and obviously then on site, um, they will be able to borrow books. Our library uh, in Carlow College stays open until 8.45 every night. Um, so once they're on site for lectures on Tuesday and Thursday, they will obviously have access to the, um, <clears throat> to the library while they're there. So as well as that, in terms of archives at Carlow College, um, we're, we're very lucky because we have a, a huge range of archival mater material ourselves. So there's the Delaney Archive, first of all, um, and there's also the Keefe Library and the Thomas Wall Collection, um, which we're working our way through and hopefully students will have access to um, as time goes on. So really the, the archive and library situation in Carlow College itself is very rich. Uh, but uh, even to add to that, uh, students, as I already said, will have access to the library at Carlow IT. Um, and again, all of the electronic resources that go with that um, are, are fully available to students as well. Now, in terms of the history collection at Carlow IT, it wouldn't be as extensive as the one at Carlow College. But uh, in terms of archival material at IT Carlow, um, there's a broad range of stuff as well. There's the Geoffrey Hand collection, the FX Buckley collection and the Patrick Given collection, for example. So, um, you know, there really is a huge uh, depth of archival material available to students. And in terms of getting uh, those coveted secondary readings, um, you know, there is ample resources available both electronically and on site. Um, so, yeah, students are they, they should be fairly well equipped to produce the absolute best assignments that they can. Thank you. And, uh, you know, we've had some questions uh, throughout and I, uh, you know, I think a question that's on everybody's mind is the dissertation um, and also the project if they're doing, they're enrolled on the uh, postgraduate diploma uh, program. Um, some questions just, uh, I'll direct this to Elaine, um, but some of the questions that have come in um, related to the dissertation um, is how long should the dissertation be? Uh, does the dissertation topic have to be um, uh, related to the Southeast? Um, and again, uh, just maybe elaborate more on this dissertation um, and the project. I will, of course, uh, because sometimes people think the word thesis or, you know, long project and they begin to panic and think, how am I ever going to put that many words on paper? 
And the reality often is that you come back uh, as you're working through all of these, um, you know, this assignment throughout your, your college life and you're begging for more words because you have so much to say. So the first thing I will say is don't be daunted uh, by this and don't be daunted by word counts. But for the MA degree, uh, students will complete a 20 to 25,000 uh, word thesis um, at the end, and they will have that ready by the end of semester four. But you don't do this in isolation. You're not sent out there into the world to write a thesis without any help at all. You have a dedicated supervisor that works with you throughout the entire process of your, of your thesis. And same goes for the, the postgraduate diploma students. They will undertake a 10,000 word project. And we use the word project because we've left it slightly loose there in terms of some ideas that might come forward for that. But regardless, um, again, you know, you, you will work with a dedicated supervisor on your project. So everybody is going to have somebody to guide them through the process. And by the time you really begin uh, work on either the project or the thesis, you have put in a bit of time with uh, lecturers on the, on the programmes. You've gotten to know people, you're, you're coming up with ideas. And the, the whole process really starts in uh, semester one. So that by the time you hit semester three or four, you have vast amounts of work done um, on, on these capstone projects. So it, it's ongoing rather than crammed at the end, if you know what I mean. And um, so, uh, Regina already mentioned this, that some of you might be coming in with the ideas in your head as to what you might want to research. And uh, others have absolutely no idea at all. It doesn't matter which one that you are. Um, you will begin to work uh, towards this capstone project while you are doing your study. Um, you don't have to come into it with an idea. You don't even have to come into it with a remote idea. Um, that will all come to you as you begin to work um, in this uh, and study and learn in this program. So, um, and you work with lecturers even to drum up some of these ideas. So that's kind of the fun of it all. And really, I suppose, what you want to be able to do at the very end when you have your project or you have your, your MA thesis is that it, 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 you, you want to take that out into the rest of the world. Uh, you want to be able to attend history conferences now and maybe deliver a paper on your chosen topic. Uh, you might want to write journal articles uh, for, for historical society journals or even some of the more national journals. So. It, by building this project, it's going to enable you to be able to do those things as well. So that's the aim behind having such a such a project, uh, such projects, should I say, built into the degrees. And the students will be expected to engage with primary sources, source material. And I, uh, Regina had talked a lot about uh, the collections that we have, the library collections. Um, what type of archival material is in these, you know, the different collections that we have. Um, that was the question, and I just think it's relevant uh, to the dissertation, um, you know, as they're drafting a dissertation or a project, um, th what's the expectation of the archival research? Well, I suppose I'll just take that question very, very briefly, because I, I, th I think the best way to think about this um, in terms of investigating primary sources and researching primary sources is really to think of yourselves as cold case detectives. You know, you're going back in time to try and find the evidence to solve a question or a, a, a situation uh, that, that's, that, that you want to actually research. So to say what's in the archives, well, the, the archives, if you're looking at the national archives, if you're looking at local archives, there's a huge array uh, because alongside the ones that Regina has just mentioned that are particular to Carlo College or Carlo IT, you also have your local um, county library archives um, that often have a wealth of material in them. Uh, so th that's a very broad question, but what will happen in terms of your research in Carlo College is that we will hone you into areas that will fit your particular research questions and we'll guide you towards the archival sources um, that will suit what it is you're trying to investigate to enable you to carry out the best research because the best research um, yes it's important to read books it's important to read journal articles very important to do those things 
but it's more important to go back into the primary evidence and find the answers yourself, uh, solve the puzzles yourself. And that's what brings the fun to history. Um, so we will guide um, and we will be uh, working with students based on what it is that they want to do. And, you know, again, going back to the idea of having no idea at all and you haven't a clue what you want to do, well, then we might sit down with you and look at some of the archival sources that are available and see if together we can work out a project. Thank you. Uh, and I think kind of we're kind of coming up. I said 45 to 50 minutes. I want to try to keep it there because we may have some more questions that are coming in. Um, I guess kind of maybe just start to wrap things up and looking at the application process. Um, you know, questions that people may be asking as, as they're, they've started you know, listening to the, about program content, teaching and learning is, you know, who is this program designed for and how would they go about applying? Um, I know there was a question uh, a bit earlier of some, um, you know, if, if someone were to have um, hold a level seven um, a degree, but to have significant career practice portfolio of publications. Um, so maybe touch more on the different application processes, um, you know, what is the application process? Who can they speak to if they need, if somebody has further questions related to the programs? And I'll direct this to Elaine. Okay, that's fair enough. Um, well, the application process, you literally go onto the Carlo College website and you will see the link into the MA or the postgraduate diploma. And depending on um, whether you have a level eight degree or whether you do not have a level eight degree, you have two choices of application form. So if you have a level eight degree, you would use one application form. If you, have, uh, if you don't have a level eight degree, you would then go to the recognition of prior learning application form and you would complete that one. It's important that there might be a different name on it at the moment. Uh, Eric, you might actually remember that, but um, the, the important thing about this, um, you know, th these degrees uh, going forward is that, no, you don't have to have a level eight degree in history in order to enter these MA programs. You can have a level eight degree in cognitive disciplines. Um, you can have a level seven degree and you can have vast experience or good experience. Uh, vast might be a bit excessive. Good experience um, working with you know, historical publications. You might be published yourself. Uh, you might have worked in heritage or tourism or something like that where you can bring uh, something to the table in that way. So nothing is closed off. Um, in terms of experience, uh, it's, it's hard to define it, you know, because everybody's going to be different. The important thing in that regard is to just fill out the correct application form. And the other thing I would just say to people is please read the instructions before you go in to complete the application form, because there's certain documents that you might have to upload as you're completing the application form. And uh, there's no, the, the, the downside, I suppose, is that there's no opportunity to save and then go back into it again. You complete it all the way through. Um, I'm not sure if I've answered all of your questions there, but I will say that uh, you can contact me um, at Carlo College. It's ecallinan at carlocollege.ie, and we we'll put that up at the very end. Um, if you have any further questions, or if we've missed any of the questions here tonight, you're very, very welcome to make direct contact with me. And what if somebody doesn't have a level seven or level eight? Is there an opportunity to apply? But they, again, they have a lot of career experience or publications. Yes, there is. Um, and again, you go to the, 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 the second application form and you complete that application form because the space is in that whereby you can show uh, what experience that you have had uh, in regards to this. And when is the uh, application deadline? Um, when is the expected start date for this program? And what if I start in at the MA program and let's say I get through the program and my circumstances change, is there an opportunity for me to exit uh, with the postgraduate diploma? Um the, I, I go through the first questions first and remind me if I forget any of them. Uh, the closing date for the application is the 30th of July. Um, and we will be making decisions the following week. So that is a definitive closing date um, in terms of the, both of these programs. So there is no late applications on it um, at all. Um, 
the I've forgotten your second question in regard to that now, but um, the start date. For... The start date, sorry, the start date, um, I, I think is the 6th of September. Um, Margaret actually might know that off the top of her head better than I do. Um, but anyway, it's very early, it's early September that the programme will actually start. But you will be informed, um, you know, relatively speaking, within the first or second week of August um, as to whether you have or have not a place. Hopefully it's have a place on um, whichever programme it is that you're applying for. Um, you asked about whether people can change um, from the MA to the postgraduate diploma or vice versa. Yes, they can, but they will probably, uh, no, they, they will have to make that decision by the end of semester two. Um, they will have to kind of reach a decision as to which way forward they want to go at that stage. Have I got everything there? I, I think you did. Um, and it is just a question on, um, you know, if the application deadline you said is when? 30th of July, 2021. Okay. That's perfect. And what's the turnaround? I mean, how, how long does, uh, how, you know, how, when will they know if they're accepted onto the program? What's the turnaround to make plans, you know? I really hope that the answer to that will be that they will have an answer by the first week in August. Um, I think it first week in August commence on the 3rd of August, but I can't exactly remember. Um, but we should have an answer back by that first week in August. And there was a question early on, I think at the very beginning, and I, you know, it is relevant for the application. Is there any funding available for this? We don't have any in-college funding available for this uh, program as of yet. Um, now, you know, we have introduced a number of scholarships over the years for students, and we will hope to be doing so, I imagine, for this program going forward in the future. But at the moment, we do not. I'm not fully au fait with things like uh, Susie Grants and so on and so forth, but if you have questions in regard to what? funding, can I suggest that you contact the admissions office of Carlo College and Sabrina or Karen there will be well able to inform you on that kind of funding. And uh, you're a bit late this stage for uh, the Irish Research Council funding for research, but certainly next year you could make applications for that. Margaret, did you want to jump in there? I did want to jump in there, um, Elaine. This is a part-time master's course. Oh, and sorry, yeah. as such, it's not actually eligible for any state funding or, or Irish Research Council funding, which is only available for, for full-time courses. So, so, so just to say that, um, and you know, I, I think this is something we, we had in mind when we were setting the fees for the course. And one of the reasons, you know, that we kept those fees um, as low as we, we possibly can. So essentially it's costing a little over a thousand euros per semester um, uh, to, to do the course. And there is a question on can, be pay, can fees be paid in installments um, uh, I, off the top of my head, I don't know the answer to that other than to say we do have a fees and refunds policy that's on the Carlo College website that details um, all of that information. But if you send um, Dr. Callanan an email, uh, we can track that question up in particular. Um, there is another question here related to the application and academic references that might be required for applications. We're not requesting necessarily academic references. I mean, if you haven't worked or st studied in an academic field, you're not going to be able to provide an academic reference. If you have, it's preferable to have an academic reference. Um, if you have not um, experienced academia in that way, then you're, you're looking for work references or you know whatever area you happen to be in that maybe has some specialization to it, rather than a character reference, something that tells us a little bit about um, you know, your ability to work and your punctuality and all those kind of important things. But there's a little list actually on the instructions to the application form that give a guide to the kinds of things that we're looking for in a reference. Now, that doesn't mean that you have to have every single bit of every single thing in a reference. We are aware that you're relying on other people to write your reference for you. Um, but there's a guide there as to what we're looking for in a reference. Thank you. Um, I was kind of looking through to see if I've answered all the questions that have come through the Q&A. I think we have. There was a question there, um, if I can find it, 
um, that was really uh, related to, uh, you know, the, the college, uh, its Catholic ethos and how that maybe is manifested in the curriculum um, and college administration. Um, would anybody have any insight into that? Maybe I can answer that as the Protestant on the team. Um, the co college really has a rather lovely written ethos, which is based on, on really social justice and on equality. And I think that's really all pervasive throughout our college. And we also have social care programs, you know, so it should very much reflect um, their involvement um, in the college as well. Eric, if I might just um, add in that um, we do have a history talk tomorrow on at lunchtime, a virtual lunchtime session, how I made history my career with Finbar Dwyer of the Irish History, Irish history podcast at 1 p.m., which you can book through Eventbrite just to flag up that before we leave. Yes, thank you for that uh, announcement. You'll see there that, again, we have the information there, ecalanin at carlocollege.ie. If you have any further questions, please direct them um, to Dr. Callanan. Also, this, uh, my understanding is this virtual session will be placed um, on the Carlo College website. So uh, you will be able to um, go back and if there's anything that, uh, you, you know, you, you thought that you heard or you want to go back over that, um, it'll be posted on the Carlo College website, um, I believe, on YouTube as well. So this information is there. But again, um, if you have any questions at all about either program, um, please contact Elaine at ecalanin at carlocollege.ie. Um, again, all of our policies uh, are... Uh, on the Carlo College website. So again, there was a fees related question. Um, again, that's the fees and refunds policy is on the college website. But again, if you send Elaine an email, uh, we can answer those. So that's it. Again, I'm, I, I'm one, I like to stick to time, uh, 45 to 50 minutes. I know everybody's busy at this time of the year. Um, so um, I have nothing else uh, no further questions. Uh, hopefully we answered all your questions. I said from the onset that uh, we wanted to answer all of your questions. Um, so again, if you have more questions, please do not hesitate uh, to contact uh, Dr. Callanan at ecallanan at carlocollege.ie. Um, that's it for me. Um, and I want to say thank you to, uh, in particular, Margaret Hegarty in marketing, who was able, uh, who really set this all up for us. Um, and my esteemed colleagues here uh, that you see um, for their great insight into this exciting new program. Um, we'd like to see many of you um, on this program uh, because I do think it is uh, a, 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 a very much an asset uh, to the Southeast region.